Welcome back to another very special episode of the Experiential Travel Podcast, where we interview hosts that do experiential travel correctly and just right, and that crush. Uh, we are interviewing a phenomenal host today. So basically, she's living my dream out. When you see those videos on Instagram and TikTok and every single social media, it's like, I just want like a huge piece of land with a bunch of house for me and my family to live on. That's that's what she's doing. And she's cash flowing the shit out of them. Uh, she not only has a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful property in Hocking Hills, Ohio, that she has three gorgeous cabins on from gigantic to a little bit smaller than gigantic to tiny, tiny, uh, which is for me, I have a feeling why she did what she did, but I have I have an I have a guesstimate of why she did what she did, but she's going to fill in that guesstimate. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna guess first, and then we'll fill it in later, and she'll uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There are three beautiful eco cabins in Hocking Hills, Ohio. Uh, they are sitting on 32 acres, and I am so excited to learn all of her tips and tricks. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Jamie Jenkins. Thank you. It's great to be here. This is, uh, we've done a few podcasts, but this one's a little different spin. So this will be fun. Yeah, I am so excited to have you on. I first want to, uh, I really want to throw my guests out first. I just want to start off with a banger. I'm going a little off script here, but <laughs> did you start it out? I have two guesses and you tell me which one's right, if any of them are right. One or if, I have a feeling both might be right. One, you did it because you wanted a space for all of your children to have their own place that they could come and stay, but also stay with you guys. My second one is, my second guess, which is more like a business strategy guess, is that you built one and it was the bigger, the biggest one. And then it had all of these bedrooms and then you were like, I want a couple's retreat. So then you went just smaller in occupancy size. Those are my two guesses. So a little of both. Uh, we built the first one for our okay. family. Um, at the time, we were smaller. <laughs> we keep adding grandchildren. So initially, it accommodated us. And it still could. It's just a little more crowded. So we knew that we wanted um, three structures to accommodate us. We have two grown children. They both have spouses. They're growing their families. So we knew that was that was the end goal, to be together but not be under each other's feet. And if you've ever traveled with generations of family, you can hear me on this, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in, the, in Absolutely. doing that, the Carpenter's Cabin sleeps up to 12 guests. So it, it accommodates a lot of people. One of the things we learned, we built it first, and one of the things we learned in doing that is that because of its size, it we get a lot of requests for bachelorette parties and mm. less so at bachelor parties, and they're not our people. Uh, we want the generational families to come stay. So if we're going to decline you <laughs> if you see your bachelorette <laughs> party, they've, we've hosted a few there. We've had a few guests that have had bachelorette parties, and it just doesn't work well. There's it's amazing to me how, you know, a group of 20 something women can't clean up after themselves. <laughs> so we don't want you to go somewhere else. Uh, so we purposely yeah. went smaller uh, when we built and we did want to mix up the sizes. So 1234 just sleeps four. It's our most luxe, which I feel like is saying a lot because all three properties have the same organic luxury amenities. That one just has more. <laughs> Um, and then Glow Cabin is just the tiny romantic getaway. And I was thinking at the time that our son and daughter-in-law can use that. And now they're expecting and doing February. So I don't know. I think Scott and I are going to end up in the little one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. The parents get <laughs> get booted off to the small exactly. one. That's amazing. Okay. I want to start. I want to start from the beginning. I want to know why Hocking Hill. And then uh, what made you get into starting this beautiful site that you have to date? Yeah, so we were familiar with Hogging Hills. We hadn't spent a lot of time down there. We knew that it was, it's a tourist area. 
um, and it draws tourists year round. So unlike a beach uh, Airbnb or vacation rental, which is more seasonal, or a mountain chalet that's primarily known for skiing, Hocking Hills is known for its hiking, its geography, and its gorgeous year round. So that was attractive as an investment standpoint. You know, who doesn't want revenue year round? From a family perspective, we, we all currently live in Ohio, but we make a big triangle in the cities we live in. Um, so it's not really easy for any one of us to congregate in one of the other locations. So we picked um, Hocking Hills as a destination thinking, okay, it's a draw that our kids would want to come to, right? <laughs> We've got the pool, pool here, here at home if they'll come, and then down there you've got everything. The irony is that um, family-wise, we seldom venture out and do all the touristy things. Our property is so gorgeous that we stay on property. <laughs> and we've had guests do the same thing. They'll write in the guest book, hey, we were planning to do this or that. And we've so enjoyed the property that we just stayed put. Um, and that's a huge thing. When we were looking at property, you asked how we found it. We actually used a realtor that knew the area well. Um, and the pro <laughs> we looked at several properties and we actually looked at properties for several years. And one deal fell through and started looking again and weren't seeing what we wanted, weren't seeing what we wanted. And she presented this one to us and it looked good on paper, you know, before we got there. My son actually went with me to look at it. He's like, you need to get this one. We're huge um, four-wheeler <laughs> fanatics. Uh, we don't like guest ride because of liability, but that's what we do when we're there. Even my seven-year-old grandson, you know, is riding his four-wheeler through the pines. Um, but because of the way the pines are planted, <laughs> they're the perfect width to ride four-wheelers in and out of. The property was priced a little bit more than what we wanted to go. And so our realtor said, hey, you know, I've spoken to the listing agent and they said, you know, nobody's made an offer in three months, which is crazy down there. You know that it's overpriced if nobody's approached it because land goes like crazy. Um, so we made an offer we were comfortable with and it was accepted. Now, what was the mindset there? Was it always to build a cabin to do short-term rentals? Was it originally just for a family vacation spot? Yeah. Walk me through kind of the, the mindset that you guys had. So primarily it was to buy or to, to build a family vacation cabin, the carpenter's cabin, with the thought that we would rent it out as a vacation rental to help offset the, the mortgage on it, right? And now, and like I said, we always plan to do three. And now we're looking at that because they have been so successful. You know, Scott will be retiring in just a few years and we're gonna, we plan to live off that income. So it's, it's great. It's done more than offset the mortgage. <laughs> I love that. So you go into it thinking, we're building a, a family vacation home. We know we're gonna do three cabins. We're finding land that has it. Um, we're going to rent it out when we're not there as a short-term rental to offset the mortgage. Yeah. So then you find the property and then uh, what? walk me through finding the property, making an offer, and then starting construction on the first one. I do. So I, the designs for all three cabins are my own designs. I'm an architectural and interior designer, so they're all my designs. With the carpenter's cabin, we did hire a contractor. So he took care of most of what needed to be done. Um, which in Hawking County, there aren't as many hoops as building in the city. Uh, it, it's just a lot easier to build down there. So uh, there were, I'm super jealous of that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, you know, that was a real blessing too. Um, we struggled a little bit with that particular builder. Um, we had some issues. So when we got ready to build an, the next two, which we built at the same time, um, just a couple of years after we finished the carpenter's cabin. It was supposed to be longer than that. We were originally thinking about five years out, but because of the success of the carpenter's cabin 
and the family growing, <laughs> we're like, let's go ahead and do this. Um, so, <laughs> so we did talk to some different builders and just weren't finding what we were looking for. And Scott and I looked at each other and kind of said, okay, so who wants to take on the role of general contractor? <laughs> and because of my background and what I do, he's like, well, it makes more sense for you to do it. So, so I got my general contractor's license. and um, Amazing. It, it, Amazing. Okay, so I will dive into that. What? How long did it take you to get your contractor's license? It's actually... What was the barrier of education that you had to go through to do that? It was actually stupid, easy, kind of scary, easy. Uh, you just file for it. You do have to show actually our, our banker, our, our loan, um, loan person required more documentation than what, you know, the county did for getting, getting their certificate. Um, because I had to prove to them that I knew what I was doing, but because I do manage, you know, remodeling pro projects and have always had my own business. It wasn't, you know, that was pretty easily done. So, you know, if you're someone who's in sales, it's probably going to be a little bit harder for you to get your general contractor's license. I just kind of always worked in that field. I also grew up in that. The carpenter's cabin is mm. named for my father, uh, who was a carpenter, and he and his brother built homes. So that was my life growing up. That's what I was around. What a beautiful what a beautiful like tribute to your father. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's definitely my hero and he, he didn't get to see it finished. He didn't even know we started it. Um, but he, he's there. What does it mean for you to have this as a tribute to your father? Like walk me through kind of like what, what that means to you and what it means to, to the family at large. Yeah, it um, <laughs> for one thing, it means that we're never going to sell it. <laughs> We've had <laughs> offers, but it's where our heart is. You know, it's where our family is. And hopefully I don't break down on this, but um, the day we finished it, I was actually the only one down there. Um, there weren't, wasn't any other family with me. Getting ready for the first guest to show up. And I don't know if you've ever... Heard the saying that if you see a cardinal, it's someone who has moved on returning to see you. And I closed the door and saw a cardinal. I'm like, it's dad giving his blessing. You know, so it, he would have been cheering. <laughs> he would have thought we were crazy because his whole thought was, why do you want another one? It's enough to take care of one home, right? <laughs> Uh, so he would have thought we were crazy, but he also would have been calling me every day, wanting updates and cheering me on and giving me advice. And there's so many times, especially, you know, struggling with the first builder that we hired, I wish that I could have called him and said, hey, this is what's going down. You know, what's the best way to handle this? Um, yeah. So I just kind of had to channel him. <laughs> I love that story. I love that story. I think it's so... It's so real to have the why be so pungent in your life, I think is as a guiding factor, especially, I mean, I, I work with all of my, like my family's partners and everything yeah. I do. And so it just like you, it's, it's, there, it's something special when like you're able to create something with the people that you love or for the people that you love and and get to experience that yeah. and I don't I obviously never met him but I'm sure he's so so proud of you and so proud of what you guys yeah, have done he was he was always an encourager and I know that you know just like these podcasts he would think it was as crazy as I was yet be telling everybody in the small town <laughs> you know what was going on so um yeah it it means a lot to all of us uh like I said we've had a couple of people reach out and want to purchase it. And I just kind of randomly shared that with our daughter one day. And she said, please don't. She said, no. I, I want my grandchildren to come to the carpenter's cabin. 
So that's that's where we are right now. <laughs> that's what it's. I think it's. That's what it's all about. I mean, it's literally you're living my. You're living what I want to do, and I think that it's such an inspiration to hear you talk about this because that's what I want. I want kids one day, and I yeah. want. A, a big piece of land with a bunch of homes that we can all be in and, and hang out with. And I think that's what like 99, I think that's the American dream, to be honest with you. There was this beautiful quote that I love that reminded, that reminds me of you and reminds me of you and your husband. And it's, uh, it was this guy who interviewed this billionaire and it was the, f- uh, founder of FedEx and Kinko's. And he was in an interview and he said, do you want to know what success is? And this is a, a billionaire talking about what success is. And the guy goes, yeah. He goes, success is when your grown children want to hang out with you. Oh, wow. That's really good. And yeah. Yeah. It's it's when your grown children want to come back for the holidays and want to and spend time with you. And that's, yeah. I don't know, what I think what you've done is set up a vehicle to allow that. And I think that that's the beauty of what you've done and what you've created. Yes, it makes money. Yes, right. it's a great business. All of the, the financial business side of it, yes. Yeah. But the payoff is that you, the real return is that you've set up now a place for your family to come and spend yeah. time together. So the dream of my head was, you know, for us all to have a little house on the same property. And I just envisioned, this was before grandchildren, and I just envisioned you know, them being able to move from house to house, just show up at grandma's and grab a cookie or whatever they want to do. And the the first time, because the carpenter's cabin is a little bit removed, it's deeper in the woods than what the other two are. Um, the first time that my grandson James showed up at the door of the carpenter's cabin and just walked in, I mean, my heart just swelled. And he was so proud of himself because it was the first time he had walked through the woods, you know, to get there. (laughs) So we were both beaming, but it was, it was a moment I'll never forget. I could talk about this stuff for (laughs) hours, but I do want to get into the tactical stuff because I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to do this. And I could talk about the, the power of creating these experiences for selfish reasons, but I want to get into the tactical (laughs) stuff. When you bought the land, uh, Was there talk? uh, I want to know more about the utilities that were on the land, or if you had to bring any of the utilities in. I know for us, we're raw land, we have to bring everything in. So, learning solar, learning how to haul water, learning doing septic units was a nightmare for me and a huge education barrier I had to learn through. Walk me through kind of how your land came and then what you were able to do to get your utilities. Yeah, so, um, we're kind of blessed in the fact that. If you see an aerial shot of the 32 acres, we are heavily wooded. Um, and it, where the two new cabins are, not only was it wooded, but there was a thick undergrowth too. Um, but we are just five minutes to downtown Laurelville, which is a very small town, but it means that we're able to put in a septic, we're able to put in a well, uh, we have electricity from the road, and we have internet. <laughs> So you can plug or unplug, you know. (laughs) Did your lot, so your lot didn't have water or septic. You had to put both of those in. Did you do three separate septic units for three different, the three different cabins? So that's a really good question. Um, The carpenter's cabin, because it sleeps so many, that septic, even, you know, pre COVID and before prices started getting and labor started getting crazy was very expensive to put in and it requires um, an extensive area and I went back and forth with the health department that's one of the few things you have to permit anything having to do with (laughs) water so the septic and the well have to be permitted Um, and I went back and forth with them because they wanted to take out initially like a football field size of trees, area of trees. Like, that's crazy. You know, that is not mm-hmm. eco-conscious at all, for one thing. And, you know, we have the cabin sited here because we want to see those pines. I don't want to take out a football field. So we got got it worked out. We didn't have to take out as many. Um, but... <laughs> 
someone needs to invent a different system. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just say that. So when we, when we built the two new ones, the reason we built two at the same time was because of their size and you're not, especially glow cabin being just 450 square feet and it's not designed to live in full time and it's meant just for a vacation getaway. So we were able to share a septic and well for those two. One sleeps sleeps Mm. four, the other sleeps two. So it was less, but not really because of the increase in cost. So we don't, we don't share the overall cost, but I know a lot of people think, oh, I'll build a tiny home. It's going to save me tons of money. Um, the septic for those two shared cost us $30,000. Mm. The well was supposed to be $13,000. And after they put it in, they handed us that bill and an extra bill for another $10,000 because they had to go deeper and use a different pump. The driveway to get through the pines, to do the culverts that we had to do was about $65,000. So these people that think, I'm gonna build this tiny home, you know, $150,000 or whatever, you've not, you've not even got a structure yet, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And Just to get utilities. Exactly, exactly. And that's, you know, that doesn't even include your electricity and all of that sort of thing. So um, I think that's the most important thing for people to be aware of. Those costs, you know, don't just look at the square footage price of the plan that you're looking at. There are so many infrastructure costs that are associated and it's crazy expensive. So the Carpenter Ranch is the biggest one, correct? Yes. The so Carpenter is on its own well it is. and its own septic. Yes. And then the other two share well yes. and share a septic. You actually can't see uh, the Carpenter's cabin from twelve thirty four and Glow Cabin. It's deep enough into the woods. It still maintains its its privacy. Twelve thirty four and Glow Cabin are close to each other. They share a driveway. You mentioned a little bit that you have that you're a f- interior designer and designer and architect Mm -hmm. did and that you designed all of these cabins Mm -hmm. what was the design process like in designing the first one and then the rest of the the rest of the two yeah so again uh, we were we were primarily creating this as our family getaway so each space was everything was just created with such purpose and such thought um you know, first of all, we needed to have the space to function. The other thing was that I wanted the grandkids to be excited and expired and to think creatively whenever they go to the carpenter's cabin. So that's how we ended up with the conversation pet. It's how we ended up with the perch. You know, I, I just want the kids to be super excited. But at the same time, I wanted a nice space for Scott and I. You know, I wanted to live the same way at the cabin that, that we live here at home. I wanted to be um, conscious of reducing toxins. So every selection in that cabin was ran through a series of different filters. Um, our paint, mm. uh, even the primer, the wall primer, is non-toxic. We were actually a demo home for a Sherwin Williams new paint there that is air purifying and that's used in all three of the cabins Uh, our sheets are organic bamboo Um, you know our flooring is all eco sustainable flooring our fabrics um, they are performance fabrics that don't use chemicals so i didn't want i didn't want to be living in or staying in a toxin filled cabin and i most certainly didn't want our grandchildren experiencing that over the next several years so that was a whole drive for that it wasn't a gimmick uh, a marketing ploy we did we did that for us <laughs> you know saying, sorry we didn't do it for you guests we did it for us um but that's the truth and even the the layout so when you walk in the main floor, you've got the common areas where we can all congregate uh, and do meals. We can do movie time and whatever. 
And then on the back of the main floor, you've got, there are two primary or two master suites, however you want to label it. Um, one is on the main floor and across the hall is a bunk room with a twin river full bed. And the whole thinking behind that was twofold. Uh, first of all, I was thinking our daughter and son-in-law could sleep in that master with their kids right across the hall. The kitchen's closed for glasses of water. You've got the bathroom right in that hall as well. Um, the other thing is, and this is going to sound really, really OCD, but there is just one step to get into the cabin. Um, that front deck is just one step up. The master bedroom on the main floor that the top of that bed is a certain height, a very calculated height. So when my elderly mom comes, she can easily get in and out of that bed. Oh my goodness. So it's, that you know, it incredible. sounds crazy, but everything had a purpose. Yeah. It's intentional. You, it sounds like the entire design was built intentionally with a single purpose. Yeah. And that, that is accumulation of, all the family members under one one roof. Yeah, it really was. And we're all big readers. So every bedroom has, every bed has a sconce. Uh, every bedside has a sconce. There are reading chairs in the rooms. So, you know, it's built, it truly is built for our family. Other people just happen to like it. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Well, I was actually just talking to uh, another, in another podcast, this this concept and i think the more hosts that i talk to the more it's becoming an axiom that i'm living by and that i surround my business with and it's the concept of building these experiences for reasons that are not monetarily like monetary reasons as that will yield the highest return and be the most profitable unit you can have mm -hmm. is if you build it with a purpose that solves an issue that's not financial. Yeah. And so a lot of our guests are built are the same way. They say, I wanted a vacation house for me and my family. Yeah. And I wanted a place that we could either me and my wife could get away. I built the ski res or this cabin as a ski cabin. I built this, well, I was talking to another gentleman in Texas who was who built it for him and his uh, wife. And the more I talk to these hosts, it's the more it's I'm doing this to solve a need for me. Yeah. And I think that translates directly to the guests. And I think the guests see that. And I don't think the guests are seeing like I think innately we can sniff out okay, this is, this is like an investment or this is right. someone's home, right. therefore I'm getting a better experience. And mm -hmm. I think that translates directly. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I think people can feel it as soon as they walk in. We have a lot of people say, I felt at home here. And we don't have a ton of personal items there. We've got some things um, that are my dad's that we've incorporated, but people aren't mm -hmm. really aware um, mm -hmm. that that's what that is. And 1234 was actually built in case Scott and I ever decide to live on property. Uh, I'm 58, he's 60, you know, you never know if you're gonna need a hip replace and need temporary, um, you know, accessibility. So again, that wasn't a gimmick to build it as inclusive. We did that for us and we wanted that luxury experience. We, um, we have toyed with the idea we're gonna build, build one more home uh, you know, when we <laughs> retire and we really like mid-century design and we thought we're going to do this. And I knew at the time it was a risk because we're in an area that is cabin focused and 1234 is not a cabin. It's in the woods and it's got beautiful, just stunning bedroom views of the ravine and the trees beyond. That's what you wake up to. And it's, it's crazy. Um, but it is, it's not a cabin. It's a full on luxury experience. I mean, those, those bathrooms are massive. We did a custom bath. We supply bubble bath, you know, it's, it's a, 
it's, love and we've got the outdoor kitchen with the pizza oven. So it's, it's, so it's called experiential travel because that's what I think that we're doing, right? We're offering an experience. It's not just a hotel to right. sleep for the rest of the night. It's, it's an experience. I love this this term I, I say all the time, I use it way too often. It's to disconnect in order to reconnect. Right. And I think that that's so, it's so vital for people nowadays, especially with the news and mm-hmm. social media and everyone scrolling yep. to get out in nature. Exactly. Like, like decompress and just yeah. take a breath. And so um, I want to know a little bit more about what experiences that you do offer. You mentioned a pizza oven. What other stuff like that yeah. do you guys have? So at 1234, I think people pretty much live on that back deck year round. I know last year at Christmas, <laughs> we had super cold weather and then we had really warm weather and we were out there during both uh, enjoying the outdoors. We've got a fire top, um, um, fire top table out there so you can do your s'mores. It's Bluetooth. You can hook it up and have some music up there. You've got the outdoor kitchen has a mini fridge, so you've got your beverages out there. It's got the gas grill, um, and it's got the pizza oven. And then the indoor kitchen is a chef's kitchen, so you've got everything that you need inside. And like I said, the bathrooms and the bedrooms are just killer in there. We also have uh, our son-in-law really likes vinyl, so listening to vinyl. So we have a record player. We have a Bluetooth speaker as well inside so you can connect each of our cabins has a unique spotify playlist that you can you can connect to um and the music on those is what influenced the design of each of the three cabins so you can kind of get a sense of where we were going with each so 1234 kind of a james bond rod stewart mashup Uh, so that's the vibe at that one and Glow Cabin, you know, is just meant to be a tiny little getaway for two, a romantic getaway. And I love reading the guest book where, you know, the couples will talk about how it gave them time to spend with each other um, and actually talk. And we've got some different card games that, I don't want to call them games, uh, they're kind of like um, conversation starters for couples. So, you know, it just encourages you to open up. For those who actually walk our trail, hike our trail, it's, they love it. Sometimes they'll do it two, three times a day. The property is, is honestly just stunning. We've had Ohio DNR out there. We've had the Department of Agriculture we, because we're trying to improve the health of our forest, which is a whole, whole other topic. Um, but they've all mentioned and said, you know, this has to be one of the prettiest properties in Hawking. And it truly is. So mm. if you're not hiking the trail and you're a guest at one of our three cabins, you're missing out on about 50% of the experience. You know, the design of the cabins <laughs> is one thing and the views from them, but you really need to step out on that trail and experience the property. Switching gears a little bit. Uh, I would love to understand how you guys were able to scale to three units and how you guys were able to finance it. Uh, first with the first unit and then expanding to the to the rest of the two. Also, let's even go before that, how you guys were able to buy the land, if you guys bought it with a loan or bought it in cash, and then to the cabins. Yeah, so we, um, we knew that we were going to build a carpenter's cabin when we built the land. Uh, we already had that design. So, and because we were working with a builder, we were able to pull all of that together and get the built loan for that. Um, The positive thing about working with a builder is that the bank requires uh, inspections at each stage for the payouts, right? So you might have three, four, five different payouts from the bank. So in working with a builder, in that capacity and having the loan, the building loan like that, um, the builder had to pass those inspections and then the bank would sign off, we would get our money and we would pay the bill to the builder for that piece of it. So that's a fairly smooth and easy process. The builder doesn't meet the qualifications, he doesn't get his money until he does. And the bank kind of is your heavy on that, so to speak. Mm-hmm. 
So it's wait. Yeah. So you guys were able to get a construction loan on the first we, one, but for the for the land itself, did you do that in cash or did you find? So we had. I want to say we we put twenty or thirty percent down. And then it was all rolled together on the land. Uh, in the build loan. I gotcha. And then for for the two new ones, because we were self contracting, one of the things. Wait, so I don't mean to yeah. cut you off here, but you were when you bought the land, did you submit the construction loan with yes. the purchase yes. of the we land? We had all of that pulled together. Oh, I. I had no idea you could even do that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's, I mean, it's been a few years now, but I'm pretty sure that's the way it went down. It was either that or it got lumped together at the end to where we just have the one mortgage on that. Yeah. So yeah. we do have, there are two separate mortgages because we've got the one that has the land itself and the carpenter's cabin. And then the, mm. the other mortgage is for the two new builds. Gotcha. Were you able to? How'd you get the? Were you able to get the loan for the two other builds by appraising Carpenter and the land together? Yes. So, um, and they they also look at the income stream, and because we're in an area that, you know, gosh, I forget how many cabins are down there. But if you work with someone local rather than a, a, a we worked with a community bank that knew that market well and knew the income mm -hmm. potential and saw our track record already with the Carpenter's Cabin, where if you work with um, a bigger bank, it might be it might be a little harder to pull that off. They might not understand all of that. Um, so we had no problem um, securing the loan, even though we were self-contracting, secu securing the loan for the two new ones. Um, they did an estimated appraised value based on my drawings and everything was That's good. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really good. Yeah, we've, we found the same thing. If you don't go to the Wells Fargo or Chase uh, in doing this, go to the, the local credit union, yes. the local bank, because one, they know the rental market. Exactly. Two, they, they want to lend to entrepreneurs in the, in the area. Yes. And three, this is such a new industry that bigger banks, they're going to look at how if you, they're going to look at resale value and then they're going to look at uh, long-term rental yes. potential. Yes. They're not going to look at short-term rental right. numbers on right. it. And so it's it's hard. It's hard to get a traditional financier to, to understand the vision. And it's such, and I think as we go, as we get, more into this industry and and things and people understand the potential in this industry i think yeah traditional banking will will start understanding but as of right now i i completely agree that's such a great tip is go to the local credit union go to the local bank yes. uh, because they one they want a loan two they understand the rental market and three they just it's a smoother process than trying to go to a big financial it institution. It is, and we really connected with our lender. We actually ended up becoming uh, good friends with him, and he's kind of hoping we'll, we'll move down there and get more involved in the community. But it, it just we developed a relationship, which I think is really important. That's amazing. Okay, so the next process, the next step in all of this stuff is once you get your land, your market land structure, utilities. You're up and running. Booking channels are next. So then, uh, what booking channels are you on? Do you guys do direct bookings? Are you guys on Airbnb or VRBO? And then, what percentage do your bookings come in yeah. on each platform? So we um, we book direct. We're also on Airbnb. Uh, we're on Verbo. We're pretty new to Verbo, um, and it's interesting. I mean, about half our bookings are direct, and I would say. At this point, it's probably 35% Airbnb and then the rest of Verbo. We're on some smaller sites that we, you know, occasionally get bookings on, but it, it's really not enough to register. We try to encourage everyone to book direct um, because there aren't the booking site fees. Um, and we get better guests. <laughs> I think that they mm -hmm. realized, people who book direct realize they're booking with us as a person as a family, whereas on Airbnb, those people just see, you know, big Airbnb and they don't maybe understand that 
you know, these are very personal places to us. We're not just in the, it's not like we have, not bashing anyone, but it's not like we have like 15 condos or something that we're, we're running out. It's not just a business to us. This is, this is very personal. I think that's so important for people to understand. I want to finish booking channels, but I think a little caveat is I think that's very important to, for people to understand that this is these places that we create are created from a position of like personal experience and almost like personal artistic touch. I want to right. say, I know that sounds a little esoteric, but it's, they're, they're, we're not a, a conglomerate. We're not, we're not a big company that's bi like banging out cabins. Exactly. <laughs> and so I, I do think that there is no recourse for damaging properties when people book on Airbnb compared to when they book on your site, they see the story, they see the about page, right. they see why you but built, uh, but why you built it, and a little bit about the personality of the cabin. Right, exactly. Well, a lot of them have heard our so story, I you know, through a podcast or, you know, follow us on Instagram. So, so they've got that background with us, and they feel like we they know us, you know, which is great. That's fine. I love that. So uh, numbers-wise, what is your occupancy rate and then what's your average ADR? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the average what? Uh, like uh, nightly rate, average daily rate. Um, so <laughs> occupancy rate. Is, if you don't mind yeah, saying. Yeah, we're you headed into our slower season, so we're probably – going to be more at the 50% mark for December, January, okay. February. Um, the rest of the year we're at, and I should have double checked this, but we run about 80 to 90% occupancy. So we're pretty oh, high, uh, particularly for That's the amazing. carpenter's cabin. Um, it, it's just established itself a little bit more where the other two are still new and, and, kind of getting out there. Um, the carpenter's cabin runs about five and a quarter a night. Um, and <laughs> I, I snicker a little bit when, when people say, Oh, I wouldn't ever pay that. I'm like, well, you know, it's not, you're welcome to come stay as an individual or as a couple. We have people do that, but it's not, it's well, not that's like $50 it. a yeah. night per head. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I think you're un, I think you're underpriced. I think that you could get we ha, we have, eight nine hundred. Yeah, we've toyed with different pricing, and I know we're on the lower end for what we offer in our area. And I struggle with that because I don't want to I don't want to outprice this for those families that do want to come. You know, absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I think when you start pricing higher, you do get more requests for the bachelor parties where there, there are more adult individuals splitting that cost. And I would have yeah. rather have two families of four come or, you know, something like that and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at hotel cost and what we offer versus what they offer, or, you know, just start comparing, we offer a lot and we are, you know, reasonably priced for what we offer. And some of that's just getting people in the door and, you know, they're kind of blown away like, Oh wow, this is amazing. And we are constantly asked about our beds. People love our beds. Um, <laughs> it, I, I think I need to, to talk to the company about getting a little kickback. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you guys should be an affiliate. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, you might as well just spill, right. the, spill right. the tea now. What, what type of beds do you guys use? Right. So the carpenter's cabin, the price is pretty steady. It doesn't matter if it's weekday or weekend because we stay pretty booked. Uh, glow cabin, our two-person cabin, weekdays are 275, weekends are 325 um, because the weekends fill up for us. At 1234, we're still testing pricing. So if anyone's interested, I would, I would go ahead and get booked because we are inching that up. We have five stars across the board. People are loving that. Um, and it's currently at 425 a night. After the booking channels, it really comes, uh, I think the most important part of the entire business model is your dream team. And your dream team is your 
the lifeblood behind the organization. It's the cleaners, the handyman, the on-site manager. It's it's all of the people that do the daily activities that keep the properties running, that make sure that it is that five-star experience. Exactly. Who is your dream team? Yeah. So I I manage the properties, um, even though we're three hours away. I manage them. But we we definitely have a dream team and our cleaning team, which includes our auditor, and I'll kind of explain that role. Um, we tried some different cleaning companies, and it didn't work for us. They didn't deliver the quality that we were looking for. Um, so we hire young moms uh, because they know how to clean up. <laughs> they have a lot of experience. <laughs> that, um, that actually is... <laughs> The <laughs> smartest idea I've ever heard doing this podcast. That is genius. Okay, continue. That is so smart. They're it's all contract mind, actually. employees. Um, so, you know, some do clean other cabins or do other things. Some work just for us. Um, and then we just, you know, give it to a 99. But they are, they become friends. Um, we encourage a team mentality. So about four times a year, we have a lunch together. I'll take them to lunch somewhere or uh, for the one, I think it was, I think it was in the spring this year, we had a private chef come in, which is one of the surface, service, <laughs> services that's offered uh, at the cabins. But we had a private chef come in and cook lunch for them at 1234. So they get to experience that. Um, and then we do, we pay well. Um, I have, I have high standards. I'm not going to lie, but we pay well and we're fair with a flexible schedule and they get bonuses. They get a bonus at six months. They get a bonus at a year. Um, and we, you know, we take good care of them. Our handyman, we had a great handyman and he just gave us notice the other day. So we're in the process oh. of trying to find another great one. Um, I mentioned our auditor. So the auditor role is really important to us. The auditor goes in after the clean and before the guest arrives. And she is making sure everything is perfect. Nothing is missed. She makes sure the amenities are set out, you know, whether it's bottles of water or sparkling soda or, you know, the snacks or whatever. We've got an anniversary coming in. She's setting up those special items. She also has her own special duties. So she's blowing, we're in the woods, so she's blowing off pine needles and leaves off the decks. And, you know, if ice needs to be put on any steps or walkways, she's doing that. Um, so just lots of those little things. I don't think I've ever heard of an auditor position. I love that concept. Yeah, some people call them an that inspector. Is... Yeah, we call it an auditor. Jamie, you... You're dropping knowledge bombs right now. I, <laughs> I, love, that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love, first of all, I love hiring new moms yeah. because that that concept is incredible. Uh, I also love the idea of hiring an inspector or an auditor to come and check the property, yeah. make sure everything's clean, make sure everything's done as it should be done. Yeah. And then the extra amenities. I think that so many times... Those extra amenities is really what makes that experience, that five-star experience, and what guests really, they say, oh, that like yeah. that little touch was so amazing. It, and, uh, it's a critical role for us, and the uh, young lady we have in it now does a really good job. Um, just, you know, I, I think one of the things that we do that might set us apart, too, from some of the others is, we actually have standard operating procedures. Um, and that might, I mean, we're, we're still a small business, if you want to call it that, you know, with just three cabins. Um, but we have a particular way we fold the towels. We have a particular way they go on the shelves and how many go on the shelves or how many go in the baskets. Because people want to, people want to walk into an experience that looks just like the photo. And we get that a lot. And the reason we use organic Turkish cotton towels, so they're nice and fluffy, and there's <laughs> just a little cheat for you here. There's a way that we fold them to make them look even more lush. And so there's training on how that's done. 
we train on how we make the bed. Every bed is made the same way and it's very inviting. So it's, you know, all those little things that most people don't think about. <laughs> I don't know what to call this segment yet. And I, I, I genuinely love this segment and I don't know why I like it so much, but it's okay. So I feel like in every, every host that I talk to, they've designed their property the way they've wanted to right. design it. Are there things that twofold one guests have come in and said, Oh, we would love like this. Oh, we would love this. And then you basically took note of that and then installed those. And then, is there the reverse where the guest came in, said, we would love this. We would love this. And you said, absolutely not. We are not adding that. I'll give you an example. We yeah. have a tiny home and our tiny home doesn't have, it has a loft and it doesn't have a shade on the window of the loft. And we will, we refuse. We say no. It's, and our reviews literally say, the, the reviews say, oh, we wish we had a, uh, the, a shade in the loft. Right. And in our listing, we say no shade in the loft. Like we, that's a hill that we die. On. Right. Is there an example of that that you guys have? <laughs> there actually is. We've only had a couple of comments on it, uh, but it's one of those. It, the last lady said, "I'm not being critical. I'm just wondering why you didn't put a door to the loft master bedroom or to the basement bedroom." And I said. Glad you asked. <laughs> there won't be a door there. <laughs> one, it's, it's, first of all, it's a cabin and it's a loft bedroom. And, you know, most of the time they don't have them. But we wanted that open, openness. So the, the carpenter's cabin almost acts like three different suites. So you've got the lower level walkout, which has the full over full bunks. It's got a media room and a full bath. You're down there. You've got that to yourself. That space, when it was just the carpenter's cabin for us, was actually designed for our son, who is likes to spend a lot of time by himself. <laughs> you know, he's just <laughs> and he likes his quiet time. And at the time I designed it, he wasn't married. So I thought, okay, great. Clark can go down there and hang out, do whatever, watch whatever, whatever movies, whatever he wants to do. So it's all good. That's his private space. There's not a need for a door because you're not going down into someone's private area. Um, and it's the same with the loft upstairs, even though it's not a traditional loft because we've got what we call the library on the front end that overlooks the conversation pit in the dining area. And then you go through this very short hall, which has um, kind of a kitchenette on one side and then a full bath on the other. And then you pass through the opening to the master bedroom that's up there with the third story screen deck. So you have to, you have to be pretty brazen if you're another guest in the cabin and you're just going to walk right into that bedroom. We want it more open like that. So I'm like, uh, yeah, we're not putting a door on there. <laughs> it's not, this is still <laughs> our cabin and we're not doing it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love knowing the little, the little things that like people are like, this is a, this is a hill I'm going to die on and yeah. I'm not changing it yeah. for nobody. I love that. <laughs> I love that. I, I still need a name for that question and I don't know a name yet. Yeah. Any suggestions for me? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I like your phrase, you know, the hill you die on. Maybe it has something to, to do the with hill. that. It's, Ooh, uh... I like that. <laughs> The hill you die on question. That's a good. I like that. I, I'm gonna use that. Um, oh my goodness, that is incredible. Okay, so you said that you get a lot of your direct bookings. How do you you market your direct bookings? How are you getting direct bookings? Are you running ads? Are you explain to me how that kind of marketing aspect or lead flow happens? Yeah, for, uh, and I'll use the carpenter's cabin as an example first. And then I'll talk about the other two combined. So the Carpenter's Cabin uh, opened first and the the account on Instagram that is now called Ecolux Vacations, which is the umbrella account, was originally called the Carpenter's Cabin. And it's a very large account. So that's that got several bookings. Uh, also got us a lot of vis vis visibility. So if you're familiar with accounts like Shelter, as S-H-L-T-R, 
which is a huge um, design and architecture account. Uh, we've been shared on there a couple of times. We've been shared on Midwest Living. Bob Vila has shared us. Um, and I don't even know the hundreds of cabin accounts that have shared us. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that just keeps multiplying and we get visibility that way. The Carpenter's Cabin was also featured on the Cabin Chronicles on Max Plus and Magnolia Network. So things like that oh definitely goodness. bring in business. We have done some Facebook ads um, for the Carpenter's Cabin. And they do well. Facebook ads actually do fairly well for us. The two new ones, um, you know, open post-COVID. Um, and after the Instagram changes, when everything was driven on by reels, which are going to be my demise. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole, whole different ball game. So we do more, um, we've been doing more emails and SMS. So if you head to the website, you can sign up for those. And the SMS list, I think there are about eight, eight, 850 names on the SMS list. Um, they're okay. the ones that get first dibs on last minute notifications and the best deals. So for instance, we just sent out an email and a text, text message today saying, hey, we have openings coming up for Glow Cab in the next two weeks. And here's the discount. You don't even have to use a code. Just go in and book it. So those people get that first. Um, so we're using using that a little bit more, and we've started started blogging. Our blogs are doing uh, pretty well because we're sharing a lot of information on, you know, what are the best hiking trails, or what to do if you're bringing, you know, kids, or what if it's a rainy day, or what's the best season to visit Hawking Hills. So we're doing some of those informational type blogs. We're also going to be doing. Um, a blog on how we went about custom designing that bathtub in 1234, how all that came down, how we did the faux concrete fireplace wall at 1234. So there's going to be some how to's in there as, you know, along with, I love that. You're going to have to, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to send those to me for sure. I'm going to be, <laughs> be taking notes, <laughs> diligently taking notes. Uh, are there any mistakes that you've made along the way that you that you would have told told yourself four <laughs> years ago or three years ago, whenever you guys started this adventure of yours, that uh, that you wish you hadn't made that you would have fixed? Yeah, um, I wish that we would have started the process sooner, Scott, and I have talked about that before, uh, and we did attempt to just um, you know the first offer we made on property fell through and I was heartbroken. That was, gosh, probably eight, 10 years ago at this point. Uh, so it's been a while. And then before we had the chance to start looking again, we moved two or three times. We've, we've kind of moved, lived in different cities and um, we're too far away to, to really do anything down there. Um, so if we knew what we know now, we would have started younger. So, mm. you know, not started at, you know, 55 plus, we would have probably started at 35 <laughs> I'm going yeah. farther down yep. this, this road. Um, but that would probably be one thing we would do different. Um, I will say that whenever you're building and I, but I've heard this even in the Chattanooga area too. So I think it's kind of all over, but um, finding good quality contractors um, to do quality work, to do what they say they're going to do, that um, communicate, actually show up, um, is a challenge, especially, you know, in Appalachia. Hawking Hills is the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And most people don't know there are mountains in Ohio, but there are. Um, so it can be, it can be a challenge. Great, great tips. I think that if anyone is listening to this that is on the fence of starting their experiential travel business, do it. Yeah. Do it and and one, do it for the right reasons. Yes. And make sure that you have have your why really, really nailed yeah. 
down. And I really, I can't emphasize that enough. It's, it's really to nail down your why. For At least for me, the, my biggest, call it manifestation, call it whatever you want, but nail down what it looks like and, f- and, and for who. Even if it's for yourself, if it's for the one guest that goes there and reconnects with their yeah. with their daughter or son at the property, yeah. if it's for your your dad who yeah. you want to spend have one one night there and you're building it just for him right. and to have one night there. Nail down that why yeah. because that is what's gonna keep you moving in the long run and it's what it's going to truly, truly reflect for yes. your guests as well. So I love that little note that you added there. You know, and sometimes you get surprised with Glow Cabin. We really thought um, the key demographic would be like twenty. You have to be twenty-five to book our cabins, but the twenty-five to maybe forty-year-olds, you know, booking that. And we have so many people, you know, in their sixties and seventies. Some are celebrating their fiftieth wedding anniversary, and and I think that's cool. You know, I'm I'm not sure it's incredible because we're so heavily on Instagram. I mean, I don't know if they're seeing this on Facebook or how they're finding us. Um, but I would love to know how to to tap into that because I love seeing them come to get away. 1234, you know, is um, for a more, I don't want this to sound wrong, but it's probably more for the upwardly mobile, you know, 35 to 45 kind of crowd even though yeah. older folks appreciate it because of the accessibility just the amenities and the style of it um you know those folks are, are drawn to it you know people who enjoy fine wines and the private chef <laughs> and you can get uh, an in-house massage there because there's plenty of space to do that um so it it definitely caters to a a different clientele We've also found out, kind of discovered that the gay community really likes 1234. And I think it's that modern design. Um, So it's Mm. it's just really interesting to see how each of the three cabins have not only their distinct look, their distinct distinct location on the property, um, they have their own distinct market, you know, their own following. So it's it's super cool. My favorite, I feel like I said this about every every part of this podcast, <laughs> but the to go off what we were just talking about, right? The experiences, yeah. offering a place to people to to really connect with their loved ones. Um, is there a story that you have that demonstrates that why for you? Gosh, there's. There are so many, particularly at the the Carpenter's Cabin. Um, And I'm probably more drawn to those stories because that one, you know, being that was built for our entire family and then named for my dad, it just, you know, has more my heart, our whole family's heart. But um, I love when they write in the guest book or they'll send a message afterwards saying, you know, I was... I was there with uh, my kids and my grandkids and we created the best memories and you know we spent time around the fire pit, we hiked, we watched movies and I, those those make my heart melt because I, that's why we build it so I know what they're experiencing. It's like I feel it with them and it just is the best. If that's if I can get only those guests in there, I would be really happy. <laughs> Although we've had, it's large enough that we've had um, some retreats in there, health retreats, uh, photography retreats, writing retreats, that sort of thing. And those are great too. We've had um, lots of ladies groups um, come, you know, maybe they're coming just to spend time together at our hike. Maybe they're doing, we just had a group, I think they were from Massachusetts, uh, their reading club, and they book the cabin. Mm. So it's beautiful. It's it's interesting, but I like 
I like it best when people are coming to create those those memories. And then Glow Cabin, again, you know, you get those same stories in the book where it's a couple connecting. And it's like, hey, it's, it just feels like it gives them purpose. They're not just staying at another vacation getaway. They're truly creating connection and memories that they're going to remember forever. I love that. I could not have said that better myself. <laughs> that was That was amazing. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for being on the podcast yeah. and answering all of all of our questions. Yeah. Uh, you've been phenomenal. And where can people find you? It was nice to meet you. It was fun to be on here. I, you know, I'm an introvert, but I love talking about the cabins and sharing the story <laughs> behind them. So, and I apologize, it got dark here in Ohio. So <laughs> Don't worry about it at all. Where can people find your cabins? So if you go to staythehawkinghills.com, you will find all three of them there. And if you want to see more photos, because we have hundreds of photos on the Instagram, you can go to Ecolux Vacations, which is the umbrella account. You can go to Glow Cabin on Instagram, which is G-L-O, no W-C-A-B-I-N. Uh, you can go to 1234, 12 is spelled out, 34 house on Instagram and then the Carpenter's Cabin is Carpenter's Cabin OH for Ohio on Instagram so and I didn't even get to the story of their it. names so. <laughs> oh I mean we still got time do you want to you want to you want to do it sure let's yeah. do it well the Carpenter's Cabin I'd love to know. you got a little bit of a hint uh because my, yeah, yeah. my dad was a carpenter so that made the most sense ah but a little tidbit for those families coming in we are in the process right now of building a kid's fort near the fire pit that is going to be a mini carpenter's cabin, round window, front deck and all for the kiddos. So we're <laughs> super stoked about that. Um, Glow that. Cabin was named because it sits on the point of the peninsula within our ravine. So it's surrounded by the ravine on three sides. And that particular spot gets gorgeous sunlight so people have asked why do you have so many doors and windows we have five french doors in the 450 square foot cabin it's not only because the surroundings are so beautiful and we want to look at it it's because of the beautiful glow that comes in so that's how it got its name glow cabin 1234 has a unique and very personal story uh, as just the carpenter's cabin so when we were building the carpenter's cabin, like I said, we had a really hard time with the builder. And um, I was, you know, managing that process. Scott, you know, has his own work here near Toledo. And um, it, was, it was blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, plenty, of, plenty of tears because it was a very difficult relationship. And towards, I would say about three quarter of the way through the build, I noticed that everywhere, on every clock, every coffee pot, just wherever, I was seeing 1234, the time 1234. And I'm a person of faith, and I thought, okay, God's trying to tell me something here. What's he saying? So I you know, did some research, and it basically means I'm here with you. We'll get through this one foot in front of the other. Just keep moving. And so once we got it done, I'm like, one of these two new ones has to be, um, I have to give that back to God as a thank you for what he brought us through. And just, you know, as a tribute that I know he's continuing that. So it's 1234. Mm -hmm. When you walk in, you'll see a mid-century clock on the wall that is always set at 1234 as a reminder <laughs> that you are not alone, you'll get through this. 